Okay, so welcome everyone to this week's Applied and Computational Maths Seminar at Cardiff. Uh, this week's our distinguished guest is Professor Lance Davidson from Pittsburgh. Lance is a professor of bioengineering and he's also the head of the Meth Morpho Lab, which investigates mechanical processes in cells and tissues. I think that's correct. And so Lance today will be talking about squeezing, pinching, dragging, and pulling multi-scale models and experiments on tissue self-assembly. So Lance, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and it is over to you. All right, thank you, Matchek. And thank you, Katerina, for the invite. Um, so I just wanted to start with telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm a, a, a physicist from an undergraduate uh, training and in graduate school, I worked, I had the real luxury um, and opportunity to work with uh, two phenomenal people, George Oster as a theoretical, uh, biologi uh, a theoretical biologist, many of you um, may have met George and Mimi Cole, who was an experimental biomechanician. And so um, they both, uh, they were co-mentors of mine as a graduate student. And I, um, I carried out biomechanical tests on, on this organism here, the sea urchin, as it undergoes a primary invagination, which is a folding of an epithelial sheet into the embryo that's gonna form the, um, the gut. And we, we, during this time, I also was working on finite element models um, where we could actually simulate a number of different hypotheses and um, begin to take those simulations or the, the predictions of the simulations and go right back into the experimental model and test those simulate, test those predictions. So I've, I've been trying very hard throughout my career to integrate computational modeling and for various approaches, whether it's uh, building intuition or uh, developing predictive models or even just simply explaining things. Um, but I think we're, we're entering a phase where it's really important to build models uh, for prediction and to have uh, a close integration of models so that you can advance a model, advance experiment, advance a model, uh, sort of doing this in an iterative fashion so that we can uh, build faster understanding. And the reason for that faster understanding comes from a, a set of papers that really are very influential to me. Um, this first one uh, uh, by John Platt is about the principle, it's almost a philosophy of of the scientific method called strong inference. And that uh, the idea of strong inference is that you need good models, good hypotheses that can be broken really, um, that are predictive and can be broken um, to advance science. You go, you have a series of hypotheses, you design experiments to test each one, and then uh, you rule them out. You do the scientific method as, as it was intended. Um, to really rule out um, models. And so this, this particular concept of strong inference was modified by uh, a very nice paper uh, by uh, Doug Fudge, where he actually puts in front of the strong inference method a series of really um, curiosity-driven uh, science where you really have to do uh, uh, observations and build your hypotheses. This is really an open form of, of uh, this is the fun part of science, I think that many of us recognize is the sort of early in the learning curve, you're sort of exploring and, and trying to come up with hypotheses. Um, and then this later latter part is really the strong inference method that Platt envisioned. So I wanted to take you into my, um, my research at this point and, and, and talk a little bit about what's the driving motivation. Um, I work on morphogenesis, which is the large scale tissue movements that drive um, the formation of the body and form the organs and so forth. Uh, this movie here on the right is just a, uh, a whole frog embryo um, undergoing neurulation. And uh, the, this is a confocal time lapse showing the presence or localization of a molecule F actin, which is a key element of the cytoskeleton that's thought to uh, be responsible for these motions. Now at this scale, it's very hard to see what actin looks like except as a reporter of cell boundaries. Um, but uh, we can do other experiments where we um, express the same reporter into individual cells and zoom in. And so here you can see 
Here are three cells instead of a whole embryo, uh, three cells removed from the embryo. And you can see the actin filaments within these cells organized in both the lamellopodia, which these cells are, which actin is known for assembling in, but also in a cortical network, a meshwork of actin inside of the cells. And so we're very interested in, in how this particular, uh, this particular process works. And so the outline of my talk is really, I'm gonna introduce you to some historical concepts of what I feel is important in modeling, um, really in modeling mechanics and developmental biology. Um, as I've explained, I think that there are multiple roles for uh, computational models and simulation. Um, and then um, really thinking also about this, this, uh, this most extreme result, which is you're getting out of the model more than you put in, the sort of emergence, the properties that models are telling you about, which really you wouldn't understand from intuition, right? So I think we can all build models intuitively and we get out what they do, sort of toy models. Um, but it's really surprising to me that we can actually build models that tell us something brand new and, um, and, in, and really enriching our experimental approaches from that perspective. And then, so I'm gonna go in a little bit on, on um, modeling actomyosin force production and end up with some open questions. So um, about, uh, about 150 years ago, uh, I think biologists were really interested in describing the natural world. And so you have these beautiful sort of descriptions and the effort of biologists was primarily descriptive. Um, these are, 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 are beautiful drawing some fantastic uh, vision, views of, of, of animals um, in the natural kingdom. Um, and then this here is, is the sort of center one is describing a, my favorite model system, the frog. Um, but this is sort of where about 150 years ago, I think um, the, the field of biology stood, right? And at, at that point, um, the world of, of chemistry and physics and bio and, uh, and, and math uh, were really making tremendous advances, right? So you have at this time, um, you know, modulus being defined by Thomas Young, uh, the sort of equations of contact mechanics of solid bodies, really the foundations of our current approaches, experimental approaches of atomic force microscopy uh, came from these, uh, these sets of foundational mechanics. And you have uh, Josef Businesk in 1885, who uh, defined the point load on an elastic half plane. This is also uh, underlies our, our current uses of, of in cell mechanics, uh, uh, uses of traction force microscopy. So at, at the time of the late 1800s, but some biologists, the small group, um, were really interested in um, applying the laws of physics and chemistry and math to understand how organic uh, forms are shaped. You have Willem Hiss um, to think that heredity will build organic beings without mechanical means is a piece of unscientific mysticism. These are kind of like fighting words for, um, for uh, biologists. You know, it's like, let's, let's take this on. Um, there was an interesting development of the term uh, Entwicklungs mechanic, and this is my, I don't speak German, so I imagine that this was all about uh, developmental biomechanics. Instead, it's more of a general term of mechanics, mechanisms of development. But I want to, I want to sort of take back that word uh, for the biomechanics of development. Um, and so, a lot of this was summarized in this um, this uh, pioneering, uh, uh, you know, sort of an almost an edited book uh, by Darcy Thompson. And uh, it, I mean, it's huge in the scope of its influence and, um, and the sort of topics it covers uh, that really summarize about a hundred years of the uses and thinking about mechanics and a, a more mechanistic viewpoint of biology. And so um, at this time he summarized, and I think these are really interesting um, sort of studies to go back to, uh, Willem Hiss looked at, and this is where uh, biology advances by building new microscopes and having new visualization techniques. But once you start visualizing these objects in a, in a three-dimensional way, you start to think about how they're formed. And so uh, Willem Hiss really, I think, was the first one who, who went to a hardware store 
and started to look at things on the shelves of the hardware store and thought about how they might be envisioned uh, as processes that are going on in vivo. And so he looked at rubber hoses and thought with various mechanical manipulations, they could be made to look like um, deformations that were ongoing in the uh, chicken embryo. Um, and this is still going on today. This is um, by uh, Mahadevan's group um, and, uh, and Cliff Tabin, where they, they looked at the formation of the, um, the, the gut in the mouse and thought that they saw um, a case of, um, of differential strains. And here they've built a physical analog for differential strain where they have a stiff tube that's uh, stretched out and stitched together with a sheet of rubber. And then once they relax that, um, that tube, you get this, um, this coiling, this natural event, this emergence of, of coiling that is remarkably similar uh, to the coiling of the gut. Um, and you have the, those sort of early physical analogs inspiring experiments to go in and actually measure the physical mechanical properties, the, the energy of uh, morphogenetic movements. Um, Selman was influenced and a student of Waddington's uh, who is a, a great leader in sort of theory. Uh, and so Selman actually put these little magnetic barbells, these little um, iron barbells into the folds of a, of a developing um, axolotl and saw that he could measure the forces, really absolute physical forces that were required to uh, sort of keep this, this uh, neural fold open. And we have this again, uh, sort of a reemergence of these physical methods. Uh, this is Ocher Campus's work where he's been in, uh, embedding ferrofluid droplets inside uh, the body of a developing zebrafish embryo. And by um, applying magnetic fields, he can cause those droplets to um, sort of change shape, oscillate between a ellipsoid shape and a spherical shape and measure um, strain. Um, and then uh, the elastic modulus of this tissue in vivo. So we're, we're getting some very advanced and very sophisticated approaches to do experiments in vivo. Um, and so I take you to the frog where uh, Thomas Morgan, I think before he got famous for this other organism that he worked with, um, he was a, a big proponent of using frogs and amphibians. And so um, I really like this that he says it's an admirable subject with which to begin the study of vertebrate development. So uh, thank you for the shout out, uh, Thomas Hunt. Um, and so this is our model system, the Xenopus lavis, African claw-toed frog. Um, it has a number of, of really tremendous advantages. The, the, the one that I like the most, the most is that it's, it develops very, very rapidly. This is an embryo going from the earliest time point of gastrulation to the conclusion of neurulation in just about 13 hours. Um, this is a, a natural fit to the uh, work cycle of the developmental biologist who likes to come in in the morning, have a cup of coffee, work on embryos and see the results of their work by the end of the day or at least the next morning. Um, there, are, there are tremendous advantages that one that I like, well, one of the ones I like the most is microsurgery because we can take these embryos and actually take them apart. Now this, is, this embryo is a complex 3D shaped thing. It's undergoing complex 3D motions, but by taking those tissues out, we can actually reduce them to two dimensional um, motions, which are much easier to, to, um, to comprehend and also far more easier to simulate and model. Um, and so all these different things over here on the right-hand side are, are sort of like things you can do to the frog embryo. Um, we can express uh, uh, whatever proteins we want from injecting mic um, mRNA into the embryo. Um, we can make explants. We can use the whole embryo to, like in the way that, um, that you know, uh, of, of like the way, the way that Selman was working. Uh, we can also dissociate cells and culture them like a classical um, cell culture techniques. And so in practice, um, you get many, many hundreds of eggs from a single female. Um, we can go and inject those um, 
uh, immediately after they're fertilized, raise them up the next day and dissect these tissues, reducing them to a two-dimensional form uh, rather than the three-dimensional form that they have natively. And so, um, and in, in fact, these, uh, these embryos are very useful for um, the most advanced tra transcriptomics and proteomics approaches. And so I think we're at this point where we have a, an opportunity to look at data-driven genetics of, morphogen of, of morphogenesis and mechanics with omics re resources, uh, cross-species comparisons, and then um, lineage-dependent mechanics, so things we can go in and, and measure. So our, our emerging view is that um, is when we consider the role of mechanics and development, there's sort of two ways to think about it. The first is the very hierarchical perspective where you have um, maternal factors really driving the expression of effector proteins, which then are responsible for creating mechanics. And the, it's really the mechanics that shapes the organism. But, um, but there's really feedbacks between different levels. So we think about biomechanics as the top down, Mechanobiology is really the feedback between those mechanical outputs and feeding back up into that hierarchy. So mechanics itself can trigger changes in, um, in proliferation or transcription at that most highest level. And then there are uh, local mechanics can alter the, the behavior of effector proteins um, in this sort of intermediate feedback mechanism. And so all together, the sort of uh, the top down and the feedback systems of mechanobiology are responsible for shaping tissues, um, maintaining robust development, and also providing cues, I guess, for, um, for cell differentiation. And so I've really loosely and quite, um, uh, quite terribly used the term mechanics without really defining it or giving you any specifics. And so, what, is, what are we talking about here in terms of mechanics? And it's probably been a while since any of you took you know, physics one um, to really think about mechanics. Um, and so uh, the, the, the general problem of mechanics in the embryo is that many of these um, forces are, and mechanical properties are, are generated at the molecular scale, right? So, um, and then they're transmitted from you know, this subcellular domain to um, cells and then up to tissues. And then those tissues are occurring, uh, tissue movements are occurring at then a whole other scale. And so if you consider the generation of forces down at the level of the nanometer, um, and then the tissue movements at the level of the say 100 microns or a millimeter scale, you have this huge disconnect between the source of the forces and their impact on development. This is sort of like saying, okay, whatever happens in an auditorium, you know, between individuals is gonna have an impact on the scale of the earth, right? So this scaling um, is, uh, is really a, a tremendous challenge to understand, I think. And that's where, uh, where we have to start thinking about, uh, you know, processes like mechanics. Now mechanics has a problem. I think in English, there are so many different uses of, of the term, uh, terms used in mechanics. Um, there's certainly movement. I think we all understand the principle of movement. Um, movement is just the translation of, of some object from one place to another, can th be through rotation or translation. But then strain is something that we uh, really, I think the last year and a half where everybody is under strain, uh, English is such a terrible language because we've adopted these terms from English to use um, with, uh, with these sort of mechanical principles. So strain can be defined by the change in length in one dimension over the initial length of that object. And then force, um, oh boy, I think we've tried to define force in many different ways. Uh, I don't think we've ever really come up with a good definition of force, except the operational one. Uh, force is the move is the thing that you apply to an object to get it to move. Um, everything else uh, is a. There are all sorts of other good definitions. When we think about the term stress, though, stress can be defined as the application of force over an area, and the units of of that stress are units of force over uh, units of of area. And so when we think about mechanical properties, we're also faced with a problem in that 
um, our intuition is built around our experience with the things that happen in our own lives and on our own, our own time scales and our own uh, physical scales. So we have definitions of the term viscous, which is the uh, application of a, of a, a, a force that drives permanent deformation of a material. Once you remove the force, then that material just basically stops moving. If you have an elastic material, um, you apply a force, um, that object moves, it just deforms, and when you remove the force, that object uh, deforms and returns to its original configuration. Now, viscoelastic is a, is a little bit more complicated. It combines both the sort of viscous response and the elastic response. The time change of the uh, elastic uh, deformation is uh, depending on the viscosity. And I think we, we can all sort of imagine, we can all see this in a case of uh, memory foam mattresses, which is like a miracle technology uh, for uh, improving your sleep. But you can, you can really get an understanding of how viscoelastic materials operate when you think about a, a, a memory foam. And then this last one, this last one is actually much more relevant to the mechanics of embryos. Um, you can take a, a material, I like, I like to keep a little container of a silly putty or magic putty at my desk. Um, you can take this material, um, roll it up, uh, deform it as, an, as, a, as a plastic or viscous material, and then, um, and then shape it into something that has an elastic behavior. But over time, again, it will return to a different form, a different shape, um, almost like a viscous material. And so um, this last uh, material property is actually much more like that you might find in frog embryos. And so uh, work over a number of years has, uh, has, has given us some, some uh, indications of the um, molecular factors that are responsible for the sort of viscoelastic plastic behaviors. And um, it's it, it, over, uh, over several papers, um, and I think the last one really is definitive um, by Joe Shockey and my group in 2018, uh, we were able to show that, um, that really it's the, uh, the role of the actin cortex within cells that's responsible for um, the stiffness of, of embryonic tissues at, a, at you know, the sort of um, millimeter or 100 micron uh, range. And so that drives the question of how, how do we understand this mechanics um, through understanding this, um, these molecular interactions? Sort of how are the physical mechanics of the cortex regulated by actomyosin or the cytoskeletal dynamics. And so just to remind you that, you know, there's uh, most of the, the cells that I'm, I'm interested in the frog are more like mesenchymal cells. Um, we're, not, we're not talking about the role of phylopodia or stress fibers, but rather we're talking about the role of this uh, actin cortex that um, underlies the plasma membrane of all the cells. And so um, again, looking uh, first, uh, having a, an approach to visualize actomyosin in these cells, or actin at the very least, uh, we started with an early reporter of actin, um, and we can see these individual cells with really remarkable dynamics of actin uh, contraction and relaxation. And then they, uh, these alignment, the alignment of actin in these cells is, is notable because it seems to reflect the shape the changing dynamics of this actin network um, is really a, a really remarkable. And so, um, so we can go and look at how actin is present in the lamellopodia and how actin is present in the cortical network here um, as an indicator. We did some early work about a decade ago um, looking, at, um, looking at the uh, emergence of actin dynamics as embryos uh, age and develop and finding that there is a tremendous uh, shift in how these, um, how these structures are, are formed um, so that we can look again and see how actin um, is shaping these cells. Um, contractions of, of actin networks result in, um, in, uh, in, in sort of contractions in the cell itself and so um, really wanting to understand how these contractions form. Now we can go and be reductionist. We can take a look at individual networks of actin or little patches of cortex. And you can see over this time-lapse movie about a little bit more than two minutes, 
actin contracts and then relaxes again. If you look at a chymograph here on the left is uh, early, this early time point, um, looking at across the, that time, you can see the contraction occurs and then uh, relaxation at the end. We, so we thought, okay, how do we understand this particular process of at least of contraction? And contraction is sort of universally thought to play a role in morphogenetic movements having been seen in uh, Drosophila, zebrafish, uh, mouse, and, and Xenopus. So um, really to understand how actin polymerization and contractions uh, work, um, because they're also re re highly relevant to the process of uh, what's called convergent extension, something I'm not, not really gonna talk about anymore. So the, the functions of actin are tremendously complex. Uh, actin plays a role in almost everything, every metabolic activity, every physical activity of the cell. Um, and so there's been a tremendous focus on um, all these different ways in which actin can, um, can be reshaped. Uh, the singular motor of the actin network that I'm interested in is myosin-2. And so um, motors polymerize into uh, mini filaments that then uh, assemble structures like this, a mini filament of a, of a single motor that then interact with actin uh, within the cell. And so we started, because we really didn't know anything, I think um, starting from a position of ignorance is terrific because then you, anything you do can be productive. Um, and so we started to build uh, toy models of F-actin and myosin, thinking about how a, a, fil a filament of F-actin would respond to a, a force applied at a point. And then thinking about mo motors such as myosin, uh, which would attach to a filament at one point and then search out a region for other actin filaments. And so when we applied these, we combine uh, filaments and motors together, um, we could do it in a two-dimensional manner because um, we're really thinking that this actin cortex that we see is actually a very thin uh, rectangular slab, um, that actin is moving through this cytoplasm with a specific uh, of viscosity, and we could introduce periodic boundary conditions just for ease of computation. And so we had certain rules for how myosin worked in that um, myosin is known to um, uh, hydrolyze ATP in order to take steps in a directed way down an actin filament. So myosin motors always uh, march to the plus ends of actin filaments. Um, and because motors can attach to two filaments, they can simultaneously march to two ends of actin filaments, and in, in doing so, pulling those filaments together. And so we can we could look at the effect of pulling them together just as a simple consequence of the motors being moved, the motor head domains being moved apart, and calculate the effect of that sort of a, a spring-like force on these uh, two individual filaments. And so really the first, the first effort on this was uh, to look at actin in red here and motors in green and uh, almost like a, a, a CA simulation, but these were all Langevin driven. And um, the striking thing to us out of this was everything we did, uh, all of the motors accumulated in the middle of the domain and then everything came to a stop. And um, at the time we were like, oh, this doesn't make any sense to us. This doesn't look right. Um, and so uh, we sort of sat with that for a while until a graduate student came to me um, with an idea of, of simulating this. And we began a collaboration with Bart Ermentrout to try to understand sort of like what's going on in these simulations. Um, and we decided to go backwards to go from something that's more um, perhaps more realistic in a 2D model. We went to something that's really almost a 1D model where uh, we, uh, we basically pinned the minus ends of actin filaments at a point and let actin filaments interact with each other um, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different domain. And so these kind of simulations, like the one on the right, um, don't look anything at all like the actin and myosin interactions that we see in vivo. But they let us start to look at the roles of polymerization and motor activity in a simplified system. And I think our, our sort of 1D system parallels the development of experimentally 
of uh, sort of 1D experimental models such as uh, Manuel Terry has used to look at actin and myosin uh, in reconstituted systems. And what we found was that without uh, polymerization or depolymerization in this case, the filaments always align and they align in one, uh, they align in some direction. But of course, they're all pinned at one location and all of the filaments are going to be swept uh, to one orientation. If you increase a uh, polymerization, um, at some point, the randomness that's introduced by depolymerizing a filament and moving it someplace else will prevent that polymerization, prevent that alignment into a particular direction. So this really posed to us that there is a, a com competition between um, motor activity and polymerization. And so um, we, we thought we should be able to, to reduce these simulations into continuum equations. And so Bard uh, took over at this point and developed a, 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 a population based, a probabilistic based model um, under uh, sort of a extreme conditions where we could consider the uh, sort of steady state of these systems. And we could uh, represent um, filaments with, uh, with no motors attached and filaments with motors attached and try to understand how those populations changed over time. Um, and out of this, actually, I think the most, uh, the most useful information came from uh, these kinds of, these kinds of uh, uh, continuum analyses where we could look at how the network uh, changed alignment with the amount of uh, and the amount of force that was produced. So each simulation has uh, an output of alignment, those filaments basically coming into some uh, high order, or and the forces that are generated at that time. And so we could change the polymerization rate um, and look at how uh, those forces and the alignment changes um, in the steady state. So when we have a very low rates of polymerization, as I was telling you, um, we have very high alignment of the actin network. We have when we have a very uh, uh, high rates of polymerization, um, where the network is becoming disordered frequently, um, we have very low uh, levels of alignment of the filaments. But what's interesting to us is that the the forces produced by this network, even though it's artificial. Um, show us that, um, that a lot of force is generated not when the filaments are all parallel and all aligned, but really when um, their uh, order or their alignment is, is more disordered. And that there's really two, uh, you know, sort of at any point up here in the curve, there's really two very different actin morphologies generating the same force. So you really can't say that you know this actin network is generating one force. It's not a linear relationship, or it's it roughly, but not exactly. And so this this oversimplified model was um, was really very important for telling us more about how uh, polymerization works and the role of motors, especially the velocity and and rates, the sort of biophysical rates of motor activity. Um, but fundamentally. You know the motor. The model was wrong. There is no physiological analog for this uh, computational model that we uh, we developed, and so it did provide us intuition um, that I think was very useful. But no cases of physiological examples of, of filaments rotating like this. So uh, we adopted a kind of a a, a, a a different approach. The idea was to free the actin filaments. And so we started to build simulations where um, filaments were no longer uh, pinned at this at their minus ends. And so starting with a very simple model, but the same, the same basic uh, principles, we could uh, simulate uh, myosin motors attached to two filaments um, and then um, modifying their polymers, their um, movements. And so we built a scheme that allowed us to sort of look at actin filaments in a, uh, forming such a network and, and what they would do. Um, this is just a, 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 a pseudo code that uh, sort of or how we organize this particular model. And so <clears throat> increasing the complexity, um, we start to see, you know, really some very interesting dynamics that look a lot like uh, the actin contractions that we see. Now, what we see here are only contractions. 
they only reach a, a steady state where um, actin is forming a, 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 an aster like structure and the motors themselves are uh, accumulate at the center of that aster. And this we can think of as sort of the midpoint of a contraction formation before that, that, that contraction resolves. And so we could do all kinds of things with these because of course it's, it's uh, easier to modify the motor rates and, and polymerization times and polymerization rates in, an, in a model that, that are really actually very hard to do experimentally. Um, and we can, we can then measure say uh, force production in these simulations. Um, one of the important things that we see is that uh, much of the force production that happens early in the simulation before there's a lot of accumulation of myosin at the center of, the, of this aster. And that once you get to this point here where myosin motors are gathered in the center, uh, that's actually a, a time point where the, there's the least amount of force produced, which is kind of counterintuitive. When you look at uh, simulations or you look at live cells, you see uh, contractions occurring and, and your, your mind is drawn to that as the active um, active mode. So we can do sensitivity analyses um, where we uh, change polymerization of actin, sort of making them like, um, like drug, like uh, acetylcholazine or latrunculin treated cells. And we can see that these singular asters that develop, actually you see multiple asters develop in these, uh, these kind of situations. These are very similar um, uh, uh, outcomes to chemical uh, inhibitor application to actin networks where you can destabilize polymerization or enhance the polymerization where you get giant asters forming and so forth. So um, I don't wanna take you through all of these various simulations, but, but basically we could do a whole lot of, of uh, different uh, uh, testing that we can't do in vivo. Um, and so I think these, these particular simulations went uh, further than our, our 1D sort of non-physiological model, um, identifying factors of polarity, what's called polarity sorting. That is the actin filaments are um, the minus ends or the plus ends of the actin filaments are, are gathered at the center of that aster. Um, micro, uh, these motors are really the, uh, the driving force remodeling the actin network, but the motors themselves are redistributed and trafficked and trapped by uh, remodeled actin networks. And that the aster itself doesn't produce force. Once the aster forms, that's like the heat death of the universe. There's nothing else happening. Um, what's really interesting to us is that um, we identified viscous drag as, a, as a, an emergent property. Um, and we really hadn't considered the role of, of uh, filaments actually moving motor, moving um, through the cytoplasm that the motion of the filaments themselves would introduce viscous drag. But it turns out that uh, most of the energy in the system is dissipated as you might expect. And that dissipation occurs through uh, viscous drag. So most of the energy of the actin network is not uh, to generate tension through the network, but to deposit energy to move the cytoplasm around. And so we could keep on going with uh, lots of simulations and, and take in terms of say fixing filaments in a region, watching how actin networks form. Um, and I, I think that's sort of where we stand is that we could do experiments with these simulations. But so that that particular situation was we, you know, we had a, 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 a we went from a very non-physiological state to kind of a partial physiological state. We're looking at a patch in the cortex. We now wanted to know how actin filaments might shape a cell. And so uh, we started to embed uh, these actin networks within uh, sort of cell-like structures um, where there's a boundary region uh, connecting a cell to a, a much larger elastic uh, homogeneous me medium. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how actin assembles at boundaries of cells um, and how that influences the formation of, of actin networks within the cell. And so with this, we began a collaboration with um, Adam Martin at MIT, and he had a postdoc at the time, Celine Chenet, who was trying to understand the uh, feedback mechanisms of uh, global tensions on actin networks. And so 
Uh, we built these simulations along these sort of lines to explore uh, this kind of mechanical feedback uh, network. And so um, using the fly as a way to uh, create, a, uh, modify the mechanical microenvironment, the tissue mechanics, and then explore how that uh, changes um, myosin and actin dynamics in these in these embryos. And so uh, we we took our sort of standard model of actin and actin filaments and motors um, operating and put them within a, a bounded um, uh, structure and looked at how those uh, boundary filaments would then interact with free filaments to shape uh, the cell cortex. And so we could explore the uh, the role of the compliance of the of the this um, cell in microenvironment going from a compliant structure that has no boundary to one that has um, has a stiff boundary, and as you can see, um, with no no boundary at all, everything. This is again a, a chymograph where we're looking at the intensity of of actin and myosin uh, across the diameter of a cell, and then in time. Uh, you can see these asters form. So this sort of uh, Y-shaped structure in the chymograph is really the formation of a single aster. Uh, when we increase the stiffness of this boundary, we see the development of a, of a ring-like structure um, when the boundary itself is stiff enough. Um, and this is a, a much more stable structure. And if we uh, take this, um, this stable ring, um, and actually use a, a, an anisotropic boundary. So we can change the stiffness of the boundary uh, surrounding this domain, putting sort of a soft region up here and a stiff region over here. We can begin to even direct the shape and the, uh, of, that, of that actin network within that, um, within that boundary. So with this model in place, um, uh, Adam and Celine could go back to the uh, fly embryo and start to test the role of anisotropic uh, tissue tension. And so, um, typically in the zebra, in the in the uh, in the fruit fly, uh, there is a thought to be anisotropic tension, but they could introduce anisotropy with uh, laser cuts uh, using a laser ablation system and then uh, look at high resolution about how the myosin networks in these cells are shaped. And so um, doing a number of different comparisons with different uh, mutants of flies as well to introduce iso isotropy or, or uh, reduce isotropy with anisotropic manipulations. And again, they could, they could see that when they, um, when they introduce anisotropy, these uh, at myosin networks are shaped um, but when they uh, introduce isotropic environments, they can see these little rings of myosin form uh, within each cell. And so this is just an example of uh, a network of cells. This is looking at the whole embryo on the, uh, from anterior to posterior. And you can see that when you make laser cuts at these lines, that you, um, that you, form, uh, you form myosin contractions in a, in a ring-like shape. Um, and then when they uh, increase the compliance, um, they can suppress uh, these myosin ring formations, getting uh, sort of aster-like structures within individual cells. So the, the summary from that, I think, is that the sort of uh, tissue cortex mechanical feedback, the feedback between the uh, microenvironment surrounding the actin network um, is responsible for shaping some of the, the anisotropies in the force generation uh, within the uh, fly epithelium. That anisotropy is really helping to shape uh, the, the, the furrow itself um, by generating high uh, tension in the long axis of the furrow and, um, and, and low tension in the, um, in the dorsal ventral directions. And so I right, just wanted to sort of finish up by, uh, by talking a little bit about how we're advancing now. Um, all of that work was, was, has been published, but um, I think we're, the, the reason why we started it was to look at how these actin networks shape uh, frog embryos and vertebrate embryos. And so here's uh, 
a movie of actin and myosin in, in cells that are responsible for driving elongation of the frog embryo. And um, these movies were made possible by the development of new probes. These are not probes that we ourselves developed, but really ones that we're, we've adopted and starting to apply in frog. So the, um, the, I, I like to keep my color schemes the same. So I'm showing you here, actin is in a, a, a magenta, and that's due to the presence of a probe, a life act with a fluorescent protein called M scarlet. And then green shows you where um, myosin two is localized. And that's due to the, the presence of a, of a intrabody SF9, which is a, a synthetic uh, antibody single chain that's coupled to a, a really remarkable fluorescent protein, uh, M neon green. But what that allows us to see are, are, are really the sort of dynamics of uh, actin contractions, which you can see in these movies. Uh, along with polar, uh, lamellipodia, these sort of bright magenta regions are where cells are extending uh, protrusions onto neighboring cells. Um, and th those protrusions actually don't have any myosin within them. The myosin is really confined to the cell body, the, the cortex, and you could really make out those, um, those network connections. So these, these uh, actomyosin networks exhibit all sorts of complex cycles of contraction and, and relaxation. We can also see that, there's, uh, that there is a pattern from say one cell to another cell. And so we're, we're wondering about how cells communicate and how that communication can regulate actomyosin. Um, and then lastly, we're, we're interested in going back to this question of, um, of the role of viscosity and say how myosin um, might, actomyosin might carry out work. I'm beginning to um, uh, freeze up, I feel. Um, but, I, but that's sort of where we're, we're headed. And that lastly, we think that actomyosin models begin to help us understand these complex interactions of, of how this hierarchy operates. Um, in particular, sort of the presence of effector proteins uh, beyond um, myosin that shape the actin network. Uh, cross-linkers, effectors of capping, uh, 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 factors that will, will cleave actin filaments. Um, how do you regulate the disassembly of an actin contraction over time? And then how do these really relate to um, tissue development? And so throughout this sort of process, we sometimes we like to think like a, a fly person. So the work with Adam Martin, sort of allowed us to step away from frog for a little bit, where we're always thinking about the three-dimensional contributions of actomyosin networks and um, the simplifications that, that thinking like a fly person brings are, are really kind of, uh, they free us from uh, too much work about uh, vertebrates. Um, but then we always have to come back and think about, uh, think like frog people. This is uh, this amazing experiment that Mangold and Speyman did uh, where they cut pieces of tissue out of the early uh, amphibian embryo and put them into a different location, generating a whole new um, identity, a whole new axis of development. And so um, I think we always have to think like physicists where we really want to begin to, to imagine that uh, we can we can create a simulation that carries out all of the processes that we see in biology. This idea that, you know, I can't really understand a system until I can create it in a, in a simulation. Um, I think that is a, a noble aim to take that, we, you know, to understand these. Don't, don't be afraid to, you know, open up the black box and start to take apart those pieces. And so um, I wanted to thank the uh, the, the person who's, who uh, was working identified actomyosin as a key uh, experimental role in the frog, and that is Hei Young Kim and, and Joe Shockey. Um, and I'm, uh, if anybody wants to uh, join us this spring in, um, in 2022, we are uh, restarting in person uh, courses at Cold Spring Harbor um, where we do bring people in. And, um, and uh, 
we'll see how things go. And hopefully by March and April, we'll be back, uh, back to work. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lance. Uh, we would typically be clapping now, but it's quite difficult on Zoom. Thank you very much. Oh, I for have to mention one last thing. Yeah. Money. Money is very important. Uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Science Foundation um, have supported this work, and uh, uh, we get some frogs from the National uh, Xenopus Resource, which is uh, a place where we can get transgenic frogs, so um, people can share those uh, those new uh, those new model systems. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, if we have any questions from the audience, uh, please unmute yourself and ask away. I have, who else wants to talk? Uh, it's just me. I think you, you can start. I have some questions as well, but I'll ask later. Okay. So thank you, Lance. It's a very, very interesting uh, talk. Um, I, want, I have two questions actually, uh, hopefully very fast. Uh, the first one is about uh, assuming the embryonic tissue is viscoelastoplastic. You said this is like the current uh, latest way of doing things. I remember you are Von so the work with Von so if I'm pronouncing that correctly, had linear, uh, had a viscoelastic material. So is that because, uh, as you know, we have been doing work with the linear viscoelastic materials. Do right. you, is there any? Um, I think, you know, I mean, the insights we, we are drawing now? Or? Yeah, I, you know, so on the short term, and so most of our work um, measuring mechanical properties of embryonic tissues, for technical reasons, we've been very limited in being able to measure those um, material properties over, say, maybe three to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, over three, over that time period, the embryo is, um, is fairly static. I mean, we think about it as fairly static. Um, but I, you know, the longer term, if we look at say the accumulation of strain in a tissue, mm -hmm. um, we can see that strain is actually uh, dissipated um, fairly quickly within about an hour. So if you, uh, if you say, um, we've done some experiments where we can confine a tissue in a, in a physically constrain it from changing shape and then uh, relax the constraints uh, there's a certain amount of recoil in those tissues that account for the morphogenetic movements that went on while the tissue was constrained. But mm -hmm. some of that, it never does recover the full extent of the strains mm -hmm. that, were, that were developed. Um, mm -hmm. And so there, there's dissipation that comes from remodeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, there's, a, there's some really great work from... Uh, Yanlan Mao and uh, Cherish and others experimentally manipulating uh, tissues such as these um, and, and you know, looking at longer term plasticity, I think is, um, is something that the field has to move towards. So, you know, the, the, the difficulty with plasticity is, I mean, it's important to understand uh, the, the long term dissipation of, of strain energy because if we're imagining that the embryo is using strain energy or strain or, or mechanical tension as a, as a cue, an instructional cue, um, if those tensions are lost over a certain period of time, then those cues are lost. Um, you know, it's sort of like if you want to draw an, an analogy between uh, secreted growth factors and mechanics. Um, a secreted growth factor would dissipate into the tissue and at a certain distance, it's no longer sensed. Um, mm -hmm. Mechanics or elastic strain or, or stress may have a similar kind of behavior that, you know, first off, stress local, generated locally will not be felt beyond a certain uh, range, but because of viscous dissipation, those stresses will also uh, be lost. And so whatever you know, instructional cue comes from mechanical stimuli would be lost if they're, if they're lost into plastic deformation. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, I'll just jump in here because uh, we can continue the chat afterwards. But perhaps yeah. anyone else in the audience would like to have a question, and if not, then we'll be finishing up. So. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, yeah, I'll ask my questions later as well. So let let's thank Lance again for a very very interesting talk. And uh, this is the last talk of this term. So mm -hmm. we'll be restarting next term in probably late January. So thank you for coming this week. Uh, have a good Christmas and see you next week. And Lance, please stay. And we'll have an informal chat now. And I'll stop the recording now. Thank you. Happy New Year. Oh yeah, as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you much for your effort.